Welcome everyone to the Race to Zero webinar series, Uniting Asia to Combat Climate Change. Last Wednesday, we covered climate change and the transport and energy sectors. For this morning session, we will focus on greening the cities and the built environment. Recording in progress. Before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. Our format for this webinar is that we will all let all our speakers present first, and then we will have a Q&A session at the end. However, feel free to post any question or comments you may have at any point during the session. We will collate them and have our speaker address them during the Q&A. We also request you to indicate the name of the speaker to whom you're addressing your question. Now that we're done with the housekeeping, let me welcome Arpus Manila Building Leader and Associate Director. His practice is primarily focused on advanced structural engineering and leading multidisciplinary projects. He managed a wide range of projects, including mixed-use high-rise development, industrial and manufacturing plants, sludge treatment facilities, airports, and healthcare projects. His experience extends to application of resilience building design, the use of performance-based approach in high-rise building design and rehabilitation, and retrofit design of existing buildings. Let me welcome my boss, Engineer Edmund Assis, for the opening remarks. Thank you, Faith. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fourth session of the COP26 event with our theme, Greening Cities and the Built Environment. What is this all about? Our world is facing a global challenge, which is this global warming, that if we are to maintain business as usual, our temperature will increase to beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Right now, we are at already at 1 degrees, and to avoid this, we need to cut our greenhouse gas emissions injected to the atmosphere. The projection is to cut around 45% by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050. Failure to do this can mean a major shift in our climate. Our cities need to be designed to become more resilient to withstand the potential extreme weather conditions, such as strong typhoons and flood. In fact, we are experiencing this now, and this can worsen. Our built environment, our cities, contribute significantly to these greenhouse gas emissions being thrown to the atmosphere. This relates primarily to two sources, the embodied carbon emission coming from the processes to build our cities and the operational carbon emission coming from the energy to operate our buildings. We need to explore on how we can reduce the carbon emissions in constructing and operating our cities. This is what we mean by decarbonizing. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of why we are here. This is not just about learning and planning for it. We have to act now collectively in order to mitigate the climate change. For this morning session, you will hear from our speakers from their share of experiences in decarbonizing our built environment and making our cities resilient. I hope this session inspires you to act now. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Faith. Thank you, Edmund. Let's now hear from exciting roster of speaker. Our first speaker for today is the founder, president, and CEO of IDEA, a global innovation practice. IDEA believes in being the best advisor and solution provider a client can have. The firm is passionate about leading clients to the best design solution for their requirements, helping ensure their businesses succeed and grow while transforming and enriching communities and people's lives. With over 800 projects in 90 cities in 60 countries across five continents, IDEA ranks 39th in the World Architecture 100's annual survey of the world's biggest architecture practices. May we now have architect Abelardo Giorgio Tolentino. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Faith. Our, my topic today is about digital transformation in the smart city. The cities where, we, where more than half of all humans live account for nearly two thirds of the CO2 emissions that lie at the root of our planet's looming climate crisis. Across the globe, 
cities account for most of our carbon emissions and energy use. While cities cover 3% of the Earth's land surface, they create more than 70% of all carbon emissions, mainly from buildings, energy, and transport. They also consume 78% of the world's primary energy. Currently, 54% of all people live in cities, a percentage that is projected to rise to 70% by 2050. As the population grows, so does new construction, resulting in even higher energy consumption and carbon emissions. To keep global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees centigrade or below, cities have to achieve net zero emissions by mid-century. As the world faces economic, health, and social setbacks due to COVID-19, solutions that can maximize limited resources can solve multiple issues are critical. Throughout history, technology has played a critical role in the evolution of cities. This time, however, progress will be in the digital realm where emerging technologies are facilitating the emergence of smart cities that feature advanced information and communication technology to help drive sustainable developments and improve the quality of life of all occupants. What is the difference between a smart city and a traditional one? A traditional city relies almost entirely on pre-planning and revisions can take a long time to implement whereas a smart city adjusts itself in the real time to the needs of the moment. A smart city is all about providing better living conditions for its citizens, while becoming more sustainable, resilient, and livable. Technology is the backbone of a smart city. Smart cities are transforming the energy landscape by creating new synergies to reduce emissions improve energy efficiency, and enhance resilience. The right combination of digital technologies create a platform for better, to better operate cities. The technologies to bring about such system-wide efficiencies already exist. Cities can take full advantage of their potential and recognize that investments in greener more efficient cities benefit not just the environment, but also the job market, public health, the well being of communities, and the overall livability and sustainability of an urban areas. What we have, uh, what I'm going to present today are five of what we believe are smart strategies uh, in smart city development. Number one is smart retrofit. An important step in creating a smart city is to green your aging infrastructure. Rather than demolish and remove the old, which takes time and money and releases carbon, great value can be gained from repurposing aging infrastructure to create new urban possibilities while retaining a sense of place. Cities should be constantly seeking to green its surrounds to address biodiversity net gain well-being, and social value. However, older buildings are also the biggest consumers and producers of energy. Energy efficiency and carbon reduction are huge issues and smart technology can play a role in reducing emissions and helping cities become more sustainable. The retrofitting process improves a building to make it more energy efficient. Retrofit can reduce carbon emissions, energy use, and utility bills, and can improve indoor air quality and thermal comfort. Advances in smart technology mean it's becoming easier than ever to retrofit older buildings. A good example of a smart retrofit is the Empire State Building, completed in 1931 and has been completely retrofitted with smart technology in the past decade and has seen more than $4.4 million of energy savings each year and a 38% reduction in energy consumption. Number two 
Number two, the Internet of Things or IoT. This refers to hundreds and millions of devices that can be connected and controlled via the Internet. Cities can process data from IoT devices and sensors to recognize patterns and needs. This can have an impact on various sectors of a city, from transport, public safety, city budgets, crime reduction, improved lighting, water, and energy systems. The true potential of IoT technology lies in its power to give real-time data for multiple sources with powerful AI back analytics that presents all data in a single dashboard for an accurate for an accurate prediction model. If cities can predict their contribution to global emissions and view the costs associated with it, both financial and environmental, the action plan to offset the emission can be fine-tuned to meet the glow to meet the goal of the sustainable generation. Number three, big data. And again, a bit of preview here. In the last three years, uh, we have produced 90% of all the data that's available in the world. But it's not the amount of data that's important. It's what organizations do with the data that matters. Sustainability climate issues can be managed using the big data tools. The term big data refers to extremely large data sets that may be analyzed computationally to reveal patterns, trends, and associations, especially relating to human behavior and interactions. They can help cities make smarter, better informed decisions especially on the issues relating to sustainable urban planning and operations. Number four, artificial intelligence and automation. These two reduce the need for human intervention. The key difference is that AI mimics human intelligence decisions and actions, while automation focuses on streamlining tedious repetitive tasks. AI and automation can complete certain tasks quicker, more accurately, and better than their human counterparts. Both are already being used in communications, sanitation, transportation, and infrastructure repairs. Just as a bit of a trivia here, the annual global streetlight electricity consumption is equivalent to Germany's annual electricity consumption. With this example, by adjusting output based on ambient light levels and weather, smart street lamps can also monitor traffic, pedestrian crossings and noise, and air pollution, as well as incorporate electric car chargers and cell phone infrastructure. AI and robotics also relate to construction and execution on site where we have the ability to generate less carbon and also execute uh, construction work and development more efficiently. Number five is digital twin. A digital twin is a virtual replica of a real world object or system. It can be used to monitor the status of its physical counterpart and predict how it will behave in the future. Since a city is effectively a system of systems, water, electricity, housing, schools, hospitals, prisons, natural environment, and the likes, a digital twin can connect these data sets from these systems to build an overview of a city that provide better information about the consequences and actions of decisions. Brought together, a digital twin can know everything about the city and can predict its every move by analyzing a range of data sources and identifying inefficiencies in these systems. Digital twins can propose more efficient approaches. Digital twins can also lower the carbon footprint of new buildings and structures by optimizing the energy efficiency of a construction process 
and by tracking and controlling the supply chains of materials and products to reduce embodied carbon. By 2022, 40% of cities will use digital space planning tools like digital twins as a part of their recovery from COVID. The market for digital twins will increase from $3.1 billion to $48.2 billion by 2026. The technology has advanced so far that it's now possible to clone entire cities. For example, a Chinese company, 51 World, has created digital twins of Shanghai and Singapore. All the technology can provide a tremendous boost towards achieving net zero cities. It does not hold all the answers. The Philippines, in April 2021, committed to the United Nations Framework Conference on Climate Change to reduce 75% of greenhouse gas emissions for the period of 2020 to 2030. However, we have been slow to act on this and are far behind on our commitments to global initiatives, despite the existence of many laws seeking to promote the use of renewable energy sources. To chart a firm path towards decarbonization, we as a nation need to lay down clearer policies and roadmaps to reach our targets. Achieving net zero goals requires deep organizational transformation and the holistic integrated approach that pulls multiple levers at once. Our inertia has consequences. The time to act is now, as the cost of complacency is our very survival. We can all do more. As professionals in the building industry, we must acknowledge the effect of our work has on the environment and focus on the steps we make to, to take to mitigate these impacts. Through our work, we are constantly involved in projects and policies that will have a very real effect on climate change. We must now look at projects differently, work to ensure that important environmental guidelines become the professional norm, and push for the design and construction of buildings with net zero energy consumption. Not all clients and partners are environmentally aware or proactive to the same degree. Regardless, we must do everything in our power to educate them and encourage them to put the environment first. It is up to us to take responsibility, to be visionaries, integrate projects and communities that are part of the global solution for a more sustainable future. Let us all act in an integrated and holistic manner. Net zero is not an abstract or an improbable task, but an achievable goal. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Architect Jojo. Let's now proceed with our second speaker. He is a licensed mechanical engineer with more than two decades of experience in building services system. He currently leads and handles team of engineers in the building services MEPF section of Manila office. He managed and tec the technical and commercial delivery of a demanding projects by producing high quality design and by achieving target profitability levels and ensuring positive cash flows. His experience encompasses all aspects of building services engineering works, including preparation of drawing, in AutoCAD Revit, procurement, project management, construction supervision, testing and commissioning, and auditing works. Having joined Arup in 2001 of April, he has previously worked in a private sector since 1996, gaining a broad range of experience across most sectors of industry to include commercial, industrial, residential, and educational facility. Let me welcome Engineer Aladin Ukol. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you see my sli slide now, Pete? Hello, no, Pete. not yet, no, not yet. Yeah, we can see it now, thank you. Okay, 
Hello everyone again. Thank you for having me. Uh, today I will be talking about the district energy, particularly related to district cooling system for a wider scale development in the context of Philippine local settings. Uh, this presentation is an introduction to energy centers. Ener energy centers are typically an integral, integral component of a district energy system. Therefore, to understand what energy centers, how they operate, it is useful to understand the context and drivers behind this district energy. We aim to define district energy, highlight the key benefits, and provide the Philippine context for district energy. The use of electricity for air conditioning system contributes to around 35 to 45 percent of our total electricity consumption. Energy efficiency of our air conditioning system is therefore imperative to achieving our energy saving targets. Among different energy efficient systems, district-wide cooling solutions is a sustainable solution for planning of a new district. It is particularly suitable for developments with its high, de high densi density or clusters of buildings, which minimizes the infrastructure required for the distribution of chilled water to the buildings of these different uses. These presentations provide a vision to help cities reduce energy demand enhance efficiency of supply and increase use of low carbon and renewable energy. The system technologies featured in the DCS were selected to show the innovative energy solution that could enable cities to achieve successful energy transitions. What is an en district energy? To give you a brief overview or background about district energy, uh, basically uh, district energy system comprises of a central energy center with multiple pipe distribution networks serving domestic hot water steam, gas, and domestic cooling around the city for use in buildings and can, al can also produce electricity locally. This energy is usually generated locally in an energy center. A transition to such systems combined with energy efficient measures could contribute as much as 50% of the carbon dioxide emissions reductions required in the energy sector to keep global temperature rise with, within two to three degrees Celsius. Uh, district energy delivers sustainable heating and cooling, connecting to local sources, resources to local needs. Uh, district energy is a proven solution for delivering the domestic hot water and cooling services through a network of insulated pipe from a central point of generation to the end user. District energy networks are also referred to as heat networks or district heating and cooling networks. They are suited to feed the local, locally available, renewable, and low carbon energy sources, such as solar thermal and geothermal heat, waste heat from industry and commercial buildings, heat from combined heat and power plants. The ability to integrate diverse energy source, source means customers are not dependent upon a single source of supply. District energy networks are inherent, inherently diverse and variable in terms of size and load. While employing similar operating principle, each network develops according to specific local uh, circumstances and adapts to continuous innovation. So why district energy? Uh, district energy system is one of the key solutions or approach to cut air pollution and to mitigate climate action, thus improve human health. It reduces carbon emissions, uh, Fuel, uh, fuel, 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 fuel depletion, climate change, urbanization, and growing population. The way we generate, distribute, and consume energy is changing. The scale and rate of this change is a major challenge for existing and new cities alike, but also brings enormous economic, social, and environmental opportunities. Cities consume three quarters of the world's energy and are responsible for 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Under condition of resource, scarcity, and climate change, future cities will need to lower their energy demand and consumption while supporting larger and wealthier population and meeting citizens' expectations for local environmental quality. The energy demand of building has traditionally been met by electricity supplied by the national grid, supplied by the individual boilers, cooling supplied by air conditioning, air conditioning units. Currently, space heating and cooling as well as hot water are estimated to account for approximately half of global energy consumptions in building. In terms of the benefits of district uh, energy, uh, it offers uh, rapid, deep, and cost-effective greenhouse gas emission reductions due to fuel switching and to decrease in primary energy consumption for around 30 to 50 percent. 
district energy improves air quality through reduced indoor and outdoor air pollution from reduced fuel pol- fuel comp- consumption. This in turn ha- has health benefits. It improves energy efficiency. Uh, operational efficiency gains up of up to 90% can be realized through the use of district energy infrastructure to link the heat and electricity sectors. It also harnesses local energy sources, including waste, thermal, uh, natural water bodies, and renewable energy. Thermal, ener- thermal storage also encourages integration of variable renew- renewables. District cooling system. Uh, it's being implemented worldwide, especially by many different kinds of private sectors, companies, including investor-owned power utilities, privately-owned energy service providers, and large multi-development projects. District cooling systems serve a, a wide variety of types of buildings, like uh, large development sites with different mix, mix increase of uh, cooling or heating demand, including commercial offices, residential, hotels, sport arenas, retail, malls, and industrial facilities. This, uh, district cooling network represents an affordable, efficient, low, car- low carbon, resilient solution to the cooling comfort of domestic and non domestic buildings in densely populated areas. In terms of the uh, concept for a district cooling system, uh, typically, air conditioned building has a localized uh, air conditioning plant similar to the image at the left portion of this slide. For a conventional type DCS, we have a central energy plant, houses all the chillers, pumps, cooling towers, and electrical substation connected to the grid. For a DCS with integrated technology similar to the image at the lower light corner, represent a DCS with integrated energy sources for cooling networks, including absor- absorption chillers and smaller scale uh, combined heat and power engines, where the heat rejected from the CHP can be captured and used for domestic heating coupled or integrated with natural sources such as thermal energy storage, uh, chilled water storage tank, ice or ice storage, heat reject- rejection from water bodies such as seawater cooling and ground source heat rejection. In terms of the components, uh, basically a DCS comprises of a centralized chiller plant, cooling towers, transmissions and distribution systems, which is uh, chilled water networks, an energy transfer station, which is the heat exchangers into the individual building consumers or end users. So why uh, DCS is uh, important? District cooling is growing rapidly for many reasons, including increasing demand for comfort cooling due to construction of many new buildings that are light tighter and also contains more heat generating equipment. A growing trend toward outsourcing certain operations to energy companies that can provide these services are more efficient it reduces the peak ele- electricity demands and provides the district cooling. Most important, the customer value provided by the district cooling service in comparison with the conventional approach to building cooling. District cooling system for the low carbon world. What does the customer want? It, uh, absolutely, they, need, they want a low cost cooling and reliable supply. What does the utility provided, provider want? Absolutely, they need profit, secure income stream, and predictable energy supply costs. And what does the world want? It reduces carbon emissions, decarbonization, and avoid fuel poverty. In terms of main benefits, having a DCS is beneficial in terms of customers, infrastructure, environmental, and environmental benefits. Customer benefits are rel- uh, rel- uh, comfort, increase in, in demand for comfort coding. Convenience, uh, cooling is always available in the pipeline. Flexibility, uh, capable of meeting variable use. Reliability, it has high reliable equipment and cost effectively provide equipment. Redundancy, flexibility to increase or decrease capacity. Enhance efficiency and reliability. And flexibility of air conditioning loads, considerably longer plant life. Cost savings or cost effective. It's very cost benefits, benefits from substantially lower electricity usage and reduced maintenance. In terms of infrastructure benefits, when it comes to uh, the DCS, it is effective and reliable when it comes to chilled water cooling. It can reduce peak demand and power aggregating loads. Shift peak demand when thermal storage is in use. 
and reduction in power sector costs in terms of capital costs for power capacity and power sector operating costs. With regards to environmental benefits, it's environmentally friendly, enables the use of alternative and cheaper fuels, fuel efficiency of DCS, which result in less pollution. Energy efficiency, uh, it re reduction in peak electricity demand and annual electricity consumption, less electricity during peak demand and can result in greenhouse gas reduction. Improve urban outlook as well and reduce distur disturbance to the other and reduce noise. Climate change uh, reduces uh, CO2 emissions or carbon footprint and minimize, minimizes environmental effect. Ozone depletion, uh, this is a key strategy for competing economical and environmentally wise space out of harmful refrigerants. Decarbonization. Uh, this is challenge, challenges. When it comes to challenges, uh, we have low energy pricing, can limit feasibility, uh, high upfront capital costs, uh, a bit a longer payback period, and access to capital impact economic viability, market penetration risk and uncertainty, uh, co customer connection in a competitive urban market, and minimum density of district thermal loads to recover capital investment, and limits use in low, re low rise residential buildings. In summary, uh, as, a pre as previously mentioned, DCS is beneficial in terms of cost, both capital and operation, aesthetics, and include, including environmental, environmental effects. Before I end my presentation, I just would like to share with, with you some of our Arab experience related DCS projects. The image on top is a recent project we have with Phil Invest Alabang. And the other two images on, tap, on the top left is a project we have with Ayala, which is in Makati and Cebu. The other three images at the bottom is a DCS project we have with our Hong Kong office. Thank you. Thank you, Aladdin. On to our third speaker. She is the principal architect of LDG Architects, one of the country's leading green architectural resource expert and consultant. Known as the Philippines Queen of Green, her penchant for environmental sustainability has brought her diverse green projects to prestigious recognition, winning the global design competition for the new Philippine Senate Building and BCI Asia's Green Leadership Award. As an alumna of Lund University in Sweden, she took the path to advocate sustainability, which led her to become among the first 100 Filipino ASEAN architects, the only professional specialized in integrated sustainable building ecology in Asia. She is one of the first Verde certified professional in the country. With this, her passion to share her international knowledge on sustainability drove her to become one of the founding members and the current chairperson of the Green Architecture Advocacy Philippines or Green AP, the country's longest running green lecturer provider for almost two decades. As an action-oriented professional, she has convened a group of equally passionate individuals with various expertise who promote and practice sustainability and form the Green Restorative Action and Sustainable Solution, or GRAS, of which she is also heading as its chairperson. It is my honor to welcome you, Architect Maria Luisa Daya Garcia. Mabuhay. It is my pleasure to be a part of Arab's Philippine event, the Race to Zero Webinar Cities and the Built Environment. You know, I underwent COVID quarantining twice this year. One was last April, and the other one was just last month in September. Actually, I just got a I just got out a few days ago from a two-week isolation due to COVID exposure. Now, this is a photo of me taken in a hospital's COVID wing sometime early October. It was my 24-7 fashion for about a week when I served as my 86-year-old mother's companion in her hospital room. As COVID affected us in so many ways, health has suddenly become today's premium and priority everywhere. 
We know that COVID-19 attacks people's respiratory system. And with this knowledge, air quality in the built environment has become a critical component in addressing respiratory health. We know for a fact that the air quality all over the world has significantly improved during the COVID lockdowns. Human activities have caused the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in forests, and even in oceans. The Global Race to Zero campaign is a necessary drive to address respiratory health and climate change. As we now spend 90 to 100% of the time inside buildings, the role of architects and design allied professionals are vital in designing our future's health and existence. The United Nations Development Program and the Climate Change Commission of the Philippines have organized the development of the standard for climate smart buildings through architectural and construction industry lenses. The standard is intended to fill in the gaps found between current national laws and the latest climate science reports. The standard is intended to be used as an additional material to update Philippine codes to upgrade policies and local ordinances. As the UNDP's Philippine consultant for climate smart buildings, the draft of the standard has been focused in the implementation of well-being that promote human-centric building standard policies. The inter interconnection of people and the planet's health is the essence of the climate smart building standard. Green Architecture Advocacy Philippines, or Green AP, an established civic society of green practitioners, has been an ally in advocating the principles of climate smart buildings. We opened the draft of the standard to public for the, to the public for comments and reviews by different stakeholders. Last year in 2020, during Green AP's 17th year Green Forum, key government personalities and noted international and local professionals joined the Climate Smart Buildings public review. This 2021 Green AP's 18th year forum held just last September brought together the voices of the youth and the importance of instilling in their young minds the value of environmental protection. Since the youth will carry the burden of the climate crisis caused by our generation and the generations before us, it is imperative that the youth is included in today's solutions. Climate change is not a problem to be discussed only among the adults, as has been the norm. Integrated Sustainable Building Ecology is a specialization that deals with holistic, environmental, and human-centric designs. This specialization is applicable to any project of any scale and type. A small project like this winning entry of a modern Baha'i Kubo house in an international platform has addressed multiple climate issues, ranging from energy efficiency to carbon emissions to negative impacts in the natural resources and alternative sources of sustenance. This is a project that has displayed the triple S design approach to self-sufficiency, survivability, and sustainability. An example of a mid-sized existing building project that is a prime mover and a role model in the practice of green architecture is the Asian Development Bank. ADB is already green, is already green building certified with platinum and gold certifications. We did a building envelope study simulation through advanced building information modeling that pushed the building's energy optimization through passive architectural features. The study resulted in significant energy reduction resulting towards net zero. Now, historical preservation is a vital part of climate change solutions. It represents an efficient use of resources and support various sustainability levels. The Metropolitan Theater is an important historical gem of the country that underwent extensive studies for its green and sustainable restoration. Indoor air quality was addressed when we found massive growths of mold, mildew, and spores, which, made, which was made worse by the theater's numerous past floodings. Sustainability improvements among many include energy reductions of at least 75% less than its baseline.
100% reduction of potable water in irrigation was introduced through different water saving design techniques. The winning design entry to the international competition, Ang Bagong Senado, or the New Philippine Senate Building, was a true collaborative practice of the integrated design process. As a project sustainability strategist, the team was guided to marry architectural and engineering features aimed to covet a five-star rating of a local green building certification. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a new construction project highlighting synergistic design from different fields of expertise intended to create unique aesthetics while maximizing climate solutions. Filipino culture was evident in the design. The concept of the facade structure has been inspired by the embroidered Barong Tagalog that serves as an aesthetic shading component designed to automatically reduce tropical heat by at least 50%. The balconies were inspired by the Ifigo rice terraces meant to promote our agricultural traditions while integrating self-sufficiency through food production. This feature also addresses mental health through good outdoor views. The raised structure addressed flooding in a typhoon and flood prone country. It was conceptualized with an open floor plan inspired by the Philippine flag's sun. This open plan maximized the building's energy reduction with extensive envelope analysis through computational fluid dynamic simulations. Overall, the project's energy use is targeted to employ net zero energy and almost 100% potable water reduction in non-potable water uses. Specifications on eco-materials and waste management were also big components of the overall design. Designing for livable cities is complex. Implementation of well-written policies, good leadership, and partnerships among different sectors and across various stakeholders are key elements towards progressive cities that are more people-centered with low carbon and climate resilient developments. My practice has given me the privilege to mentor several local government units in providing technical assistance for designing livable cities with global standards, but with local and regional needs from Luzon, Visayas to Mindanao. In 2019, I formed a group with equally dedicated multidisciplinary professionals who were advocates for environmental sustainability. We named the group Green Restorative Actions and Sustainable Solutions, or GRASS. The group was launched in the Philippine International Convention Center with experts from architecture, engineering. We have experts from urban planning, landscape architecture, and other allied professionals from forestry, health, the academe, professionals from religious groups, government, and private sector. In the same year, GRASS, in collaboration with local and international organizations, assisted Pasig City in strengthening its thrust on its health programs through the introduction of the biodiverse urban reforestation. The biodiverse urban reforestation was a pre-COVID project with the intent of providing a healing garden and park for Pasigenos. Its social function is optimized by addressing air pollution, flooding, lack of clean water, alternative food sources, mental health, and even livelihood programs. The reforestation is a living labor laboratory to teach about carbon emissions, carbon absorption, and as well as biodiversity. It was meant to teach UNDP 17 sustainable goals to the community. This unique reforestation project in an urban setting called the attention of the Philippines House of Representatives, who then invited me to join the technical working group for the Committee on Reforestation. The House bill's contents have undergone many changes and was retitled to Urban Biodiversity Conservation in the Philippines, influenced by GRASS's Biodiverse Urban Reforestation Project. The organizations that I currently serve as chairperson have actively been participating in writing position papers for government laws, codes, bills, resolutions, and the like. These are all meant to be of assistance to nation building in the practice of sustainability in the built environment. 
it is truly a privilege to be working with passionate members of Green AP, of GRASS, the United Architects of the Philippines Committee on Green Architecture, UAP's Special Council on Climate Change, and UAP's Special Council on the Natural and Built Environment. I have initiated the drafting of the Philippines Guideline for Planning of Vaccination Centers in response to the COVID pandemic. As architects and professional space planners, we extend our hand to the local government units in the implementation of systematic process of global health protocols and vaccine centers, starting from the orderly lining up and social distancing of people to the sanitary disposal of medical wastes. As an expert reviewer of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report for working group number three, the projects that I work on are highly influenced by these scientific studies. As the government drafts and prepares for updated laws, codes, and standards, which you know, can really take some time, we, the professionals, from where the design of the built environment starts from, should articulate design that boldly embraces science-based studies, complemented with innovations and technology. One of the important lessons that I have learned and would like to impart is that the separation of health and environmental policy is a dangerous delusion. This danger is the same if we separate health from the building industry practice. Health in the building sector does not begin and end in health facilities. Health in the building sector starts from responsible construction material, resourcing up to sound building design and up to the building's operations and maintenance. Our health entirely depends on the climate, the environment and the diversity of life on earth. The way we create and operate the built environment either adds to the problem or becomes part of the solution. Climate change and COVID are both health emergencies. It is imperative to stress that while COVID recovery plans are being taken, preparation for climate change solutions must be aggressively tackled as well. The difference between the two crises is that COVID could immediately infect and potentially kill anyone exposed to it, while climate change's greenhouse gases are slowly destroying the planet and are gradually threatening our survival over decades of time. You know, this is why most people are not immediately threatened by climate change. The solution wears out the intensity of the action that it actually needs. The country is still battling COVID severely due to the country's limitations in pandemic preparedness. This pandemic should serve as a strong warning to speed up our efforts in securing a safe future by preparing for a bigger threat than COVID, which is climate change. Climate emergency solutions cannot be delayed any further. Like the coronavirus pandemic, the climate crisis is a threat to our existence. And like the virus, Greenhouse gases are invisible and remain ever present in our natural surroundings. However, unlike COVID-19, there is no vaccine against climate change. This is a photo of my brother with his nurses. He was just freshly discharged yesterday from the hospital. This is weeks after my mom was sent home from another hospital. We celebrate his recovery and that of my mom and the rest of my family as we grieve for those who we have lost. We are hoping that he is the last family member to be hit by the virus. My family is hopeful that we can look forward to a better future, gaining the lessons from this pandemic. Battling COVID has required each of us to do our part. You know, we change our habits like the constant disinfecting of our hands, we adjusted our lifestyles like working from like working from and staying at home. We modified daily routines like um, we, we shop online now and we make personal sacrifices beyond mask and face shield wearing. There seems to be just so much. And you know, we can convince, and you know, if we can convince ourselves to do the same, 
if we can convince ourselves to do the same changes in our daily living in the fight against the climate crisis, we can start to finally see the real progress, probably sooner than we expect. As professionals in the built industry, we can always help our policymakers, national and local decision makers, experts and other actors willing to contribute in the preparation for the climate emergency, which, can, which we can take decisive and bold steps now through the way we live, the way we work and the way we consume. The challenge is for change leaders like us to innovate approaches affecting meaningful change. We need to enable bold thinking and take immediate actions needed to make the climate smart future that we, that we have to make. And as leaders, we need to establish protocols. We need to standardize green and sustainable practices so that we can be part of the active participation in reaching our country's 2030 and 2050 targets. We are all leaders here with the ability to convene and activate meaningful coalitions for meaningful actions. We have no time to waste. The race to zero challenge in the built environment is on. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. So maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Architect Luisa. To round out our presentation for this session, our final speaker has more than 20 years of experience in architectural and interior design, corporate real estate, construction, and property and facilities management. He has advanced his career as an independent practitioner and a team player in a multinational companies. His years of exposures to interior and fit out construction have given him hands on know how to all facets of fit out project, delivery from design to contract documentation. To construction. His experiences in architectural and interior design, corporate real estate, construction, property, and facilities management provide him with the ability to handle multiple and complex projects. Let me welcome architect Alvin Tejada. Pleasant day to everyone taking time for this COP26 webinar series. It is a pleasure to be in this virtual room of the brightest minds and in the design and construction industry. First, I'd like to thank Arab Philippines for the invitation to be part of this event and most especially to everyone who has taken time to virtually join us today. Today, in alignment with COP26 goals, we are taking time to learn and share experiences and aspirations in decarbonizing and enhancing the resilience of cities and built environment. COP26 is driving the global net zero by 2050. And among the global, the goal for the upcoming conference have been published and foremost is decarbonization. Bill Gates released his book in Feb 2021 and I look forward to reading it. I'd like to quote his empowering words. It is easy to feel powerless in the face of a problem as big as climate change, but you're not powerless. Collective actions from everyone can improve the lives of future generations. No action is too small. We should be working to pursue it from the simplest of the things to the grandest of dreams of ours. We cannot be confined only to the limits of the resources that we are currently have. We have been confined to our homes over the lockdown to contain the spread of COVID-19. Our personal businesses and social activities are abruptly disrupted by the pandemic. It made us realize that life and existence is important and our built environment can influence health and wellness. If we look beyond our confinement, it largely differs in the architecture, location, culture, etc. But we have the same basic needs to help us live, to help us keep alive. In the language of the Well Building Institute, it is air, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, and mind. And all of this is influenced by the built environment, thus, we need to look into our environment. For city dwellers, 
uh, like most of us, the lead supported it taking a closer look on sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, material and resources, indoor environment quality, innovations, and regional priorities. All of these shows an obvious connection between people and the planet Earth. Our existence is threatened by the way we live, and so we should be looking to take action on what impact most our global climate and environment. Our activities within the confines of our individual environs can impact our immediate surroundings, our communities, our cities, our countries, and ultimately the entire world. Construction industry is responsible for nearly 40% of CO2 emissions annually from the embodied carbon of materials, the construction, and the energy consumed to heat and cool our living spaces comfortably. Just three materials, concrete, steel, and aluminum are responsible for 23% of total global emission, most from the built environment. There is incredible opportunity for embodied carbon reduction in these high impact materials through policy, design, material selection, and specifications. There are many strategies that had been presented over this event. Several industry experts have shared the knowledge and experiences. Now allow me to share an opportunity that you can combine along with those that you have learned. First, carbon reduction is needed now. As mentioned, in the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC report, substantial carbon reduction, reduction needs to occur in the near future in order to avoid extreme climate disruption. Embodied carbon savings in building structure is an obvious opportunity to reduce in the short term. A promising material to look into is bamboo. <coughs> Excuse me. It is a grass that is entwined with ancient culture and tradition. In the Philippine mythology, the first man and woman, Malakas and Maganda, came out of the bamboo, which is also a symbolic of its strength and beauty. It's a traditional construction material it's strong, lightweight, and sustainable to timber. <coughs> it has regained interest in the recent decades. Many studies are being conducted to check its properties and explore its potential, not just for resort living applications, but structural materials that can be built in our cities. Bamboo's renewability credential for far exceed timber. Can be harvested between three to five years of planting as opposed to the decades that timber requires. It regrows without needing to be replanted, which provide additional environmental benefits. In its large root networks also protects against soil erosion and landslide. Giant woody bamboos are already considered effective CO2 absorbers, leaving bamboo stores similar amount of carbon to three plantations from around 100 to 400 tons of carbon per hectare. Bamboo sequesters tons of carbon. Literally every clump of woody bamboo sequester more than a metric ton of carbon, CO2 every year, which is the highest down, draw down rate of any plant or technology we know. Bamboo uses only 8% of the land area that the wood for the same amount of building material. Bamboo's unique rhizome structure restores watershed and prevents erosion. Bamboo is a perennial grass. Um, sorry, I lost it. Bamboo is a perennial grass the more we harvest, the fastest it grows. Of course, 
none of these matters for builders if bamboo's mechanical and structural properties cannot bear the structural loads. Growing body of research shows that certain bamboo species have impressive and efficient mechanical properties, including possessing strength to weight ratio. Excuse me, let me just take a drink. <coughs> Certain bamboo also have compressive strengths of concrete. Substituting bamboo as timber will save our forests from getting further denuded. Bamboo can be used for a number of durable products, including furniture, flooring, housing, and pipes, and can replace emission intensive materials, including timber, plastic, cement, and metals. For more than centuries, countries have raised building the world's tallest building with concrete and steel. Now a quiet contest is constructing tall wooden buildings underlying growing environmental concerns over concrete. Processing equipment are now available to make bamboo as boards and planks of various sizes and thicknesses. More architects are exploring the potentials of bamboo to be used in our cities. And what I'm showing the screen are some of our, the architecture that are developing. The experience of living uh, in a bamboo structure uh, with it and, and to build it with my hands is an experience that I recently had from a 10 day boot camp in Davao City. There are about 20 individuals participating in the activity attended by farmers, businessmen, resort owners, designers, and representatives from indigenous people of Mindanao. Bamboo has great potentials in constructions, constructing sustainable buildings. It is an opportunity that is available to us to explore in our cities. <coughs> that this is an industry that can support our indigenous people and farmers. The cities of the future could be built from the bamboo made using new generation sustainable building materials as alternative to steel and concrete, locking up carbon in sustainable, aesthetically pleasing and functional bio-based structure. Global emissions of carbon dioxide in 2020 were 32.3 billion metric tons. We should improve this. We got so much more experience and strategies that we have learned from our speaker and how to bring down the number. Lastly, decarbonizing an existing neighborhood is possible. We can all have our cities be resilient with an enhanced building environment. There are many opportunities available to this, and I hope that this event triggered our mind to think further. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Alvin. That wraps up for the presentations, and we'll now move on to the Q&A session. While we are setting up the session, we once again invite everyone to post their questions or comments you may have for this session. And we also request you to indicate the name of the speaker to whom you're addressing your question. And we will request the speakers to give a brief but very meaningful answer. So I see there are questions already in our chat box. So let's start the ball rolling with the question to architect Jojo Tolentino. So, how do we see the readiness of Philippines on having smart cities? And any insights on how developers are gearing to push this? Well, we're still in the infancy stage, uh, primarily because uh, we still lack the infrastructure. Uh, you probably uh, have experienced during the lockdown that uh, there were issues on something as simple as internet connection. And that's very vital for us to operate smart cities. 
Uh, there's a growing consciousness, but it's still in the early stages. I would say, you know, it will take us about at least 10 more years before we can reach levels similar to more advanced economies. But there's already a consciousness uh, for, especially with developers uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, industrial projects from our experience, looking at this, uh, these uh, smart systems and smart, looking at smart cities. Okay. Um, thank you, Architect Jojo. Thank you. So, so um, for our next question, it's for Architect Maria Luisa Daya Garcia. So uh, you shared wonderful examples of design and projects. Uh, however, from Manila's COVID-19 experience, we know that the impacts have been quite unequal, with uh, lower income communities even struggling to socially distance themselves. So how do we ensure that the designs and the transitions in general smart cities are also equitable and inclusive? You know, and in my presentation, I said that um, designing livable cities is really a complex issue. Um, there is the layer of uh, cultural, the uh, layers of culture, of politics, and so many other things, including uh, finances and all that. Um, this this uh, pandemic has really caught us off guard. So meaning, um, uh, you know, um, there are studies you know, coming from researchers from UP and Ateneo saying that we are really not prepared, you know, and uh, therefore um, it is us, the, the leaders, the professionals who have to come in and support our government and our and our um, community, um, our communities as well. Um, it's really a difficult task, but for us to be able to, to do this, we have to all do this together. Okay, thank you, Architect Luisa. So um, we, our next question is for Engineer Aladdin Uhol. So uh, given the wide ranging environmental, economic and environmental benefits of district cooling systems, why haven't we seen more of these in the Philippines? Um, can you share key barriers for their local uptake and some ideas on how to overcome them? Yeah, as, as I mentioned in one of my slides a while ago, uh, the reason being is that uh, in terms of the uh, uh, support from our government or private sectors with regards to the uh, incentives that they're looking at, other than the capital costs involved. So having a DCS uh, in terms of the initial cost is quite uh, very expensive, but in the long run, if you consider the operation cost, it's much more cheaper. But uh, I think I think majority of the uh, large uh, private sector is now uh, uh, looking at having a, a uh, district cooling system under development because they see the, the benefit in terms of efficiency and um, environmental effect for, for our, for our uh, region. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Sir Aladdin. So our next question now is uh, for architect Alvin. So providing alternative construction materials such as bamboo is a great idea to reduce the concrete volume and other materials in its respective carbon footprint. However, it also has an effect on the other aspect of the environment such as deforestation. So do we have guidelines set in terms of the appropriate volume usage of, volume of bamboo in the construction industry? Um, actually, it doesn't affect, um, it's actually a tool for reforestation. Um, bamboo um, gets to be harvested within three to five years, so the material gets easily available even if we use a lot of it. Um, actually, the challenge is for the country like ours, Philippines, which is in the tropics and which uh, inherently grows bamboo, to have more areas planted with bamboo so that um, we can be supplying uh, for the future needs of the construction industry. Um, so we just have a follow-up question. So can you also share something about the costs of using bamboo? Well, the cost of um, using bamboo is um, still um, not very efficient at this time, especially if we're using the bamboo that is raw and not yet um, processed into the laminated applications. Um, there are no... Um, 
uh, very limited data available to that yet, but China had been producing a lot of uh, timber type um, laminations for bamboo, which can be um, coming up in um, sizes and uh, construction methodology that we are uh, familiar with. Um, of course, traditional would have raw bamboo in its um, a circular form or which would be difficult to handle in um, mass construction. Okay. Thank you, architect Alvin. So our final question is for architect Luisa again. So uh, in your vast experience regarding these greening cities initiatives, how far or near is the Philippines, especially the urbanized cities with the concept or implementation of green cities? Um, when it comes to policies, we are sort of lacking in that. You know, we have a lot, as, as mentioned by architect uh, Giorgio Tolentino earlier, that we have a lot of policies, but really the challenge is how do we implement those? And in fact, now we have a lot of officials, or, or I would say even professionals, who have yet to understand or read these policies and apply them. So um, really there's a disconnect between the professionals and the, the the lawmakers, and therefore we really have to act together so that we can um, have these things laid, these things um, laid out properly. Um, so many challenge. There are so many challenges, as mentioned earlier, even um, customs and traditions. And uh, because we are in an archipelago, um, the challenge is still is also there. No, so we have to create systems based on our, our, our on uh, different regions. And um, not one size fits all. So we have to tailor fit everything for, for our cities. But so far, uh, the ones that we are doing are at par with um, other cities. We have cities that have been um, you know, winning accolades and uh, 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 getting certifications. Um, uh, uh, they're at par with other cities uh, globally. Um, but it has to be sustained. No? Um, uh, we need more professionals who can push for the practice of green and sustainable design. Um, because currently right now, as uh, mentioned also earlier, we're still in the infancy stage, even in this uh, practice. Right now among the professionals, design, uh, green design seems to still be you know, an option. Um, in fact, we already need to push for it. It has to be a standard because of climate crisis. And yet we, it's still optional. You know, so these are the many things that I'd like to share with you. Maybe at some, uh, maybe some other time. Um, uh, I know there's very limited time. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, now that we've exhausted all the questions, I would again like to call Engineer Edmund Assis for our closing remarks. Yeah, hi. Uh, I hope that everybody has enjoyed the presentations. It is good to see actual examples of projects where decarbonization and sustainability has been practiced. Thank you all for joining this session and special thanks to our speakers for generously sharing their time and expertise. We will upload the recording in our event webpage. Now, let, let me invite you to the final session of this webinar series this afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. It will explore the role of nature-based solutions in addressing cli climate change. You can find out more about the speakers and the topics from the final session on the event webpage. Please register and I hope to see you then. Thank you. <laughs>